Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. It's great to be in the house of God again. <clears throat> we always have so much fun coming up here. And I really felt like I really felt like the Lord had a word uh, for this church. I know there's a lot of people visiting, et cetera, but there's a word for the church. And as I was sitting there praying uh, on Thursday, and God spoke to me, and he said, I want you to tell them something uh, as soon as you get a chance. I don't want to barge my way in, but when I get a chance. <clears throat> and it's, we can, uh, we can sit there and watch a plant. We can watch it grow. And uh, we can stare at it and think, man, that thing's not very, making very much progress. And yet, if you've ever seen time-lapse photography... You can watch this thing kind of, you know, break through the ground, and next thing you know, there's a sprout on the side and on the side, and all of a sudden you see that flower go like that, and, <clears throat> and you can watch it bloom. And you can say, wow, what a beautiful flower. And yet, if you were standing there, you wouldn't see much progress. You would look at it, and you wouldn't notice. But when I come back every year, it's as if it's time-lapse photography. It's, you know what I'm saying? You are here, and so you watch the church, and you say, ah, you know, it just, it just doesn't seem to be making a whole lot of progress, and yet when somebody steps away, and then they step back, you say, wow, what a beautiful blossom. There are things, there are things that are blossoming <clears throat> that you may be impatient with. If you stood there and watched a blade of grass come out of the ground, you would think, you know, this is taking a long time. But when you're staring at it every day, you don't see the change. But I do, and I know God does, and I feel like that is an encouraging word for somebody that I see and feel a difference, this time especially than other times that I have come. So I feel that there is growth. I see growth. We have uh, our, our relationship goes back to the Kenai Church, and the first person I prayed for was Pastor Mendenhall, and I made a, I made a request to come up to the altar, and I, I had no clue that he was the assistant pastor at the time. I just walked up, prayed for him, God had a word for him, and I thought, man, that guy really got a touch from God. I had no clue, and uh, God began our friendship right then, and the next time I saw him, his motor wouldn't start in the boat. This guy is going to take you out and catch you lots of fish. I had never caught fish before. And we got to the dock, and we stood there and stared at him. And he was like, I don't know. I don't know. So we had a, we had a problem. We had to go stand on the, stand on the shore somewhere. But our, our relationship developed over time and, and to the point where we had many great experiences here. But then not only him and his wife had, had great experiences down uh, in Chicago, at the conference, but then one by one, the family began coming down, and now we have all had incredible relationships and uh, developed friendships with my daughter and my son, etc. And what a great time we have had! But most of our greatest experiences have been in the presence of God. It's always been about the central thing is God. So, let me get to the Word of God. Thank you for allowing me to come uh, up here again to Alaska. This is my 14th year in a row. So I don't know when the hourglass runs out, but so far, so good. But we are having lots of fun. Would you mind standing with me just for a moment as we go to the book of Mark, chapter 10, verse 46. <clears throat> Mark, chapter 10, verse 46. And they came to Jericho. And as he went out of Jericho with his disciples and a great number of people, blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the highway side begging. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And many charged him that he should hold his peace. But he cried out the more a great deal, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus said unto him, Go thy way, thy faith hath made thee whole. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus in the way. Blind Bartimaeus was there by the side of the road, 
and when Jesus passed by, when he heard it was Jesus, he cried out to get his attention. I want to preach this morning on the simple subject, a miracle for crying out loud. A miracle for crying out loud. Lord, would you touch the word? Would you touch the messenger? Would you touch the hearer of the word? <clears throat> would you bring the simplicity of your gospel to us today? Give it to us in a way, Lord, that applies specifically to us. And I ask you to bless us, Lord, for the time that we give to you. God, and we come desiring of your precious word. Talk to us this morning. We pray in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. God bless you. You may be seated. As I looked at the word this morning, I noticed something that I had not noticed up to this point, that Bartimaeus was by the roadside, and it said he was begging. He was needing something. Not only did Bartimaeus need something, he knew he needed something. He not only needed something and knew he needed something, but he wasn't afraid to let other people around him know, I need something. I find in pastoring now for 25 years, one of the greatest obstacles to overcome is not understanding that I need something. It's actually making it noticeable. God, I need something. The human nature is born with pride. And we have a very difficult time even when we need something, to ask, to let somebody know, I am not perfect. I am in need. And I need something today, and I'm not afraid to ask. I notice in verse 47, it says this, when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth. Let's get, pretty, let's get profound today. Lazarus, or not Lazarus, Bartimaeus was there. It says when he heard that it was Jesus. Well, he couldn't see. So he heard. No matter what your obstacle is this morning, if you can't see, he'll make sure you can hear. If you can't hear, he'll make sure you can see that it's him. If you can't hear or see, he'll let you feel that it's him. He's going to do something to make sure that he will overcome that obstacle to let you know he's passing by. We will say, well, but I'm blind. So I won't be able to get something from Jesus today. I can't walk, so I will, no matter what. Notice the guy that couldn't walk. Jesus walked up to him. Hi. It's 38 years long enough. Would you like to be made whole? We can, we can give all these excuses as to why we can't receive. Well, I, I, the water is troubled, and I just can't seem to get to it. And by the time I get to it, somebody else gets there. We have excuses for everything. But Jesus steps up next to him and says, I'm going to take away your excuses. How would you like to do something about it today? Would you like to be made whole? Can't hear you. He got a miracle for opening up his mouth and saying, yes, I would. I would like to do something about my problem today. He began to cry out and say, Jesus. And many charged him that he should hold his peace. It amazes me how flesh still tries to get in the way of the miraculous. Flesh will always try to interfere with the miraculous, the flesh of pride, the flesh of of position, the flesh the 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 flesh of uh, of position of, uh, of of finance, whatever it is, something will try to step in the way of the miraculous. This guy needed something from Jesus, and he cried out, "Jesus, thou Son of David, have mercy upon me." Last I checked, he didn't ask for grace. Grace is unmerited favor. You know what mercy is? Great, well, grace, first of all, is receiving something we don't deserve. 
God is giving us something we don't deserve. Mercy is holding back something we do deserve. You and I deserve to be penalized. We deserve the consequences of sin. Mercy says, I know you deserve the arm of judgment, but I'm going to withhold it. That's mercy. And yet, Bartimaeus did not ask for grace. He asked for mercy. Something inside of him said, I know what I deserve. It's easy to ask somebody for something. Would you please give me something I don't deserve? But Bartimaeus that day asked for mercy. Jesus, thou son of David. Somebody needs to realize that today. That you know what? I want to come to church and I want to get something. God is trying to talk to us this morning. He's trying to say, why don't you ask him for mercy? Why don't you come to him and say, I know what I deserve. I know who I am. In fact, there's some things that I really don't even know yet about myself that he knows, but I know he knows. You know what I'm saying? I know that he knows that I don't know. But I'm smart enough to know that I don't deserve anything. I don't deserve anything but consequences. That's what I deserve. So Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy. He didn't holler out, hey, I'm blind. Give me sight. He said, have mercy. That's the first step. When you hear that Jesus is walking by, that we open up our mouth and say, I don't deserve anything but judgment from you. But would you please have mercy? By the the, the, the uh, Miriam's Webster's dictionary said mercy is compassion or forgiveness shown towards someone whom it is within one's power to punish or harm. Mercy from someone who has the power to punish. That's the mercy I'm asking him for. I know he has the ability to punish me. And I know he knows that I deserve it. But Jesus said, go thy way. Thy faith hath made thee whole. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus in the way. Mark chapter 10, verse 51. Jesus asked him a question. Here we have blind Bartimaeus, known to be blind, begging at the side of the road. And Jesus said, bring him to me. Tell him to come to me. And we know that he cast aside his garment and he came to Jesus. And Jesus asked him a question. Verse 51 says, what will ye that I shall do unto you? I mean, in our vocabulary, my response would probably be, seriously? I've been blind a long time. You, 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 you want to ask me? I'm begging because I can't see, so I can't work. What, what do you think my problem is? What do you think I would want you to help me out with? Something happens when he comes and he says, I invite you to come to me. We come to him and he asks us such a simple question. What would you like me to do? Uh, I'd like to see. Doesn't he know as God in the flesh? Doesn't he already know everything that we need? Doesn't he know our struggles, our trials, our turmoils? Doesn't he know the, 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 the failures and problems and struggles and obstacles in our past? Doesn't he already know that? Well, God already knows, so let him decide. Oh, isn't that an honorable thing to say? Why didn't he just say, well, you know what would be best for me? He said, what would you like me to do? Um, that I receive my sight. Something happens when we open up our mouth. And we say, um, um, I'm blind. We're saying, 
I'm imperfect. We say, I'm a sinner. I swore yesterday. I lied. I stole something. I sinned in some form or fact. Something happens when humanity opens up its mouth and says, I'm unclean. I need your help. He doesn't want you to come to him and say, I'm perfect. So you should be honored that I stand here and lift my hands and my voice unto you and give you praise. Jesus said, they that are whole need not a physician, but they that are. Something happens. I know what happened to me. I walked into a service, and as soon as I opened up my mouth and I said, I need help. All of a sudden, he was there. He's like, I was just waiting. I knew you needed help. I knew exactly what the help was. I knew what the solution was. But I was waiting for you to stop me in my tracks. When he heard it was Jesus, lots of people passed by. But when he heard that it was Jesus, he said, Jesus, have mercy on me. He knew that somebody was passing by that could help him. Jesus knows that we're sinners. He knows that we've made mistakes, but he wants us to admit it to him. We no longer to confess to people. We no longer confess to a person, but we confess to him. In 1 John 1, verse 6, it says, If we say that we have fellowship with him and we walk in darkness... We lie. If we say we have fellowship, yet still walk in darkness, we lie. And do not the truth. Truth isn't something that you only know. It's something that you do. It says we do not the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light. Notice the qualifier. We can't just walk in light. We have to walk in light as he is in the light. We have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us or continues to cleanse from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. Wow. We can be deceived, but we also can deceive ourself. If we confess our sins, that's to acknowledge them. He is faithful and just to forgive. He said, if we confess, but he already knows, but he wants us to confess. If we confess our sins, then he is faithful and just to forgive. What if we don't? What if we just act spiritual? What if we just sing the right songs and show up in the right place and wear the right clothes? He said, I want you to confess. Well, if I just come to church 22 times, then it should be far enough away from my problem that I should be okay. The problem is never going to leave until we confess. Because he said, if we confess, then he is faithful and just to forgive. And the blood of Jesus will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It will continue to cleanse if we confess. When we come to him, we have to open up his mouth because he will come to you and he will come to me. And he will say, what do you need? And he will wait. And he will say, what would you like? And if we just say, I'm fine, he will say, thought so. Thought so. Well, I might come down this road again sometime in the future. Hopefully, you'll be ready then to let me know that you would like something from me. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. Romans 3.23, a very familiar scripture, all have sinned. I said that to try to include all of us. All have sinned. If you have failed God, we're together. You're not worse than the person sitting next to you. It's just unconfessed. We're all sinners. All have sinned and come short of the glory Amen. of God. In Romans 3, 10, it says, As it is written, there is none righteous. No, not 
We're all in the same boat, so to speak. We all need Him. In 1 Corinthians 6, 9, in the International Standard Version, this probably would not be popular in the public, but he said this, you know that wicked people will not inherit the kingdom of God. And we all go, I know I'm not wicked. I know at least I'm, you know, I'm, I may be unkind once in a while, but not wicked. Wicked is like, you know, with the, the, the guy with the, with the fork and the, the ears that's in the tail. That's wicked. He said, wicked people will not inherit the kingdom of God. You know that, don't you? Stop deceiving yourself. Sexually immoral people, idolaters, adulterers, male prostitutes, homosexuals, thieves, greedy people, drunks, slanderers, robbers will not inherit the kingdom of God. That's just one list. He's got three or four that we could, I think we're all covered. We got it all covered. But in verse 50, the Bible says, talking about Bartimaeus, it says that he cast aside his garment. Jesus said, you go tell, I heard him, you go tell him to come to me. And it says that he cast his garment away. Humanity, even when we get the invitation, we would like to keep things the way they are. You know, I'm blind and I would really like to go to him, so... Just come as you are. And he got up, dusted himself off, and he took, out that, he took off that outer garment. It was a long, flowing garment, and he was in a hurry to get to Jesus. He didn't want to trip along the way. When Jesus makes the invitation, there's two things that he wants us to do. We need to peel off that outer garment. Anything, what does he say? Lay aside every weight and the sin that that doth so easily beset or trip you up he said this may stop me or slow me down from getting to him so i'm going to peel this off but the second part was this i heard this probably 10 or 15 years ago that outer garment you know how garments many times identified lepers they identified royalty. They identified who you were. That garment identified him as a blind beggar. And he got up and he took that off. He was saying, I don't want to be associated with what I used to be. What about Lazarus? The Bible says that he got up after Jesus said, he said, come forth. And it says he stood up. And then the church got around him and they took the grave clothes. There are things that identified him as dead. And Jesus said, he's not dead anymore. Take off the things that identify him with his former life. There are things that identify us with who we used to be. Jesus wants us to take that off and say, I'm not blind. I'm not dead. I'm not a thief anymore. I don't want to bring my past with me. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are made new. If you're the same person that you used to be, then you're not new. I am not the guy that I used to be. It says we have to free ourselves from every weight. We have to get rid of the things that identify us with our affliction, but also it was an exercising of his faith. I'm going to take off the thing that says I am blind. God always honors faith. The Bible says in one place, and he said unto the lame man, rise, take up your bed, and walk. He, sa- he didn't say to the healed man. He said it to, to the, I'm talking to a lame man. Get up. Well, are you going to heal me first? Get up. We, we wait. Okay, I'm going to sit here. I'm going to wait until he heals me. I'm going to wait until he delivers me. I'm going to wait. And he said, hey, 
Get up and walk. Get up and do the thing you think you can't do. So his invitation comes to Bartimaeus. Tell him to come to me. It's amazing how somebody can confess, Jesus, have mercy on me. And we open our mouth, and then Jesus says, come to me. He's not yet saved. He's not yet healed. Jesus said, come here. He does that to us. And, and well, I, I, you know, I really, it's kind of inconvenient for me right now. I don't even know where he is. How desperate are you? If I was blind and I heard that there's somebody in the back of the room, it wouldn't matter to me if you moved all the chairs in the way and I had to take one at a time and move it. Jesus, are you still back there? I'm coming. I'm coming. I'll be there in just a minute. Hang on. I don't want to trip and fall on the way, but I'm coming to you. But he, he knows where I am. He'll come to me. He already did. He was walking down the road, and he wanted Bartimaeus to know, Jesus is walking down. Hey! 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 I need a miracle. Hey! Amen. But he had to reveal his imperfections. Oh, Jesus. Confession alone doesn't save, but it prepares the heart to receive. By him opening up his mouth, it prepared him to receive a miracle. He opened up his mouth, and Jesus said, yeah, you're ready. How many people were sitting next to Bartimaeus? How many were sitting along the roadside that just watched him or heard him or felt him walk past and they stayed the same. But it was the one who opened up his mouth and he said, let him come to me. Him. He didn't say them. It was the one person that said, I have a problem. Please help me. Please have mercy. I don't deserve it, but please, I know you have the power. Many sat. Many heard and many remained immovable. They just didn't want... Man, I didn't know you had that problem. You've been sitting next to me for 10 years in church. I never knew you had a problem. Sometimes in the middle of a message, people will get up. Is it okay? Is it okay if I come up now? I've had people get the Holy Ghost in the middle of a message. At least I thought it was the middle. Somebody just, something happened. Something happened in their spirit, and they said, now, am I supposed to wait until, or can I respond? May I respond anytime? If you happen to slip a hand up, I won't call on you and see if you have a question. I'll let you slip your hand up and just say, Lord, I'm reaching. I'm not ignoring the preacher. I'm not out of line. I feel, oh, oh, let's, lift, let's just lift our hands for a moment. I can feel him right now walking by. Jesus, uh, somebody is in desperate need. I can feel it right now. You're afraid? You're afraid? to make your need known. You're afraid. I don't want anybody standing up right now and say, you know, I, I'm a killer. I, I just robbed a bank yesterday. I don't, I don't believe you need to, but if you wanted to stand up, if you wanted to reach out, it's okay with me if you just said, God, I need you. I need your touch. I need the miracle right now. I'm opening up my mouth and I'm saying, Lord, I'm in need. I, I, I can't do this on my own. I've tried to do it and I can't. I can't break free. I'm in prison. I'm in prison. Would you open my prison door so that I may walk free? I'm stuck and I want to take off my garment of blindness. I want to remove my garment of sin and I want to put on your garment of righteousness. Can you feel that? Oh, 
just opening our mouths sometimes. It prepares us for the miraculous. We merely say, it's me. It's me, Lord, that stands in the need of prayer. I can't do this anymore. I'm tired. I'm frustrated. I'm wearing out. I'm putting scar tissue over the heart that was exposed to your presence that I can hardly feel you anymore. Church has become a religion for me. I don't want it to be a religion anymore. I want it to be a relationship. I don't want it to be a denomination. I want it to be a relationship. I want it to be real. I want it to be new. Like when I first felt your presence. Notice when Jesus said, Jesus said, tell him, it's okay to come. Just him speaking toward you isn't enough. You need to get up and you need to make a move closer. I can't count how many people that have actually stood up and been healed before they got to the altar, been delivered before they got to the altar. But it was the step. They stood up. I remember Elia, she took her first step. She stepped from the pew, stepped into the aisle. As soon as she hit the aisle, she was healed. Nobody prayed for her. It was just that act of faith. She just, she was like, I, I believe, I believe that what he said is true. I believe that Jesus wants to, I need mercy. It's me. I need mercy. And she stepped and she said, oh my goodness, I've been healed. The pain is gone. In my shoulder, it's gone. I could hardly sit here and focus on the word because his power was so intense. It's not me. It's not pastor. It's not anybody in this place. It's Jesus. And he's walking down the road of your heart right now. And he's saying, do you want something from me? <laughs> Tell him to come. And he's healed. Naaman was upset with the mode of the miracle. And he walked away and he was leprous. And some little servant said, you know, you're going to die. You know, I never thought of that. I was so upset with the method in my position that I just, I feel like it should be done this way. Good luck with that. Get in the river and dip seven times. That's the word. Well, all right, I think I will. It's the method that he disagreed with. It's, it's, well, I thought he would, you know, make me feel important and, and lay his hand upon the place and, and the, the, the prophet would come out himself. He said, if you obey, if you repent, you'll be forgiven. If you're baptized, your sins will be remitted. Notice he said, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And then I want you to notice something. I just preached this in a message a month ago or so. Come unto me, all ye that, are la that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Come. Well, he knows I'm tired. He knows I'm frustrated. Come unto me. All. And then he said this. Take my yoke. He didn't say, let me put it on you. He didn't say, I'll have, I'll have him put it on you. He said, take. You come unto me. I've got a yoke. I want you to put it on. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. He said, I'm going to make, there's a little opening in my yoke. There's room for one, but you need to take it. It pastor's not going to force you. God's not going to force you. He said, take you need to come and pick it up and put it on and say, hey, this is easy. This is easy and this is light. Living for God is hard. No, it's not. The way of a transgressor is hard. Living for God is easy. He said it. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. I can walk again. Why? Because you got to take yours off. You take your yoke off and you put his on. The 
yoke that you put on has two places. One for you and one for him. He didn't say take a yoke. He said take my yoke. I'm in the other side. It's where you hook up two oxen together. He said, I'm pulling on this side. You want to get in the other side? Are you kidding me? Are you, you're going to help me carry? Yes. Take my yoke upon you. The prodigal, when he came to himself, Naaman, do what the prophet says. Bartimaeus heard many people pass by as he laid there on the side of the road, lots of people walked past him. But when he heard it was Jesus, I need help. The woman with the issue of blood pressed her way through the crowd. But didn't Jesus know? Yes. But she pressed her way through and she grabbed onto that promise, the talit. She grabbed onto that. She did what she could. Zacchaeus, he climbed a tree. He didn't just sit there and wait. The Bible says he actually ran out in front of them. Okay, where's Jesus going? He's going that way. Okay, I'm going. This is premeditated. This isn't, I'll just sit and meditate in my house. And, and Jesus, if you want me to be set free, then you come to my house. No, you go to his house. You go in his journey. He's walking down the road, and he climbed up the tree, and he's looking. And Jesus walked by, and he goes, yeah, thought you would. Hey, I'm going to lunch with you. He climbed up a tree. He did something. And he got into Jesus' journey. He didn't just sit and wait. Right. Yeah. 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 Exodus, and I'm closing. It came to pass in the process of time that the king of Egypt died and the children of Israel sighed by reason of the bondage. And they cried. They cried. They put up with it for approximately 400 years. What I failed to think of for a long time is that there were many people there that never knew freedom. They were born there. There were some that went into bondage. They were free, and then they went into bondage there. But there were many that never knew what freedom was. But the Bible says that they got to a point where they cried out. They had had enough. See, there are some people that are backslidden. They knew freedom. And they decided, not yet. I'm not ready yet. And they moved back out into the world and they subjected themselves to the sin of this world, and then they cry out. But there are some who have never known freedom, and those people got to the point where they said, you know what? I'm tired of this. I don't want this anymore. They didn't just sit and meditate. They opened up their mouth, and the Bible says that God heard their cry. Yes. And he said, 400 years, huh? Well, it's about time. It's about time. It didn't say that he heard it 400 times. He finally heard their cry. They were okay with it up to that point until they finally said, I need help. I heard about a room full of doctors at a doctor's convention, and they were eating lunch in between sessions. One doctor got up from the table, he left the room, and in minutes he was dead. A morsel of food had lodged in his windpipe, and he choked to death. The tragedy is really heightened by the fact that probably any one of those doctors could have performed the Heimlich maneuver. Hundreds of doctors in a room, and somebody started choking. You okay? Why didn't he? <coughs> Why didn't he stop? Hundreds of doctors in the room. <coughs> 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 
as he's slowly suffocating. <gasps> Walks out of the room. Walks out of the place where he could get the help. He didn't have to say, does anybody know Heimlich? The place was filled with doctors, if needful. You could have laid me on the ground and given me a tracheotomy, cut my, and helped me breathe. You could have performed surgery on me right there, but it was, you know what I attribute that to? How you doing today? I'm fine. No, you're not. You need something. And we can all get up and we can walk out in a room full of people that can help us. And you can walk away and in minutes you could be dead. Would you stand with me? Mark chapter 6 as I close. Verse 26. And when he had sent them away, he had just done many miracles. He sent them and he went into a mountain to pray. And when he was come, the ship that the disciples were in was in the midst of the sea. And he was alone on the land. And he saw them from that, from that mountain. It says, he saw them toiling and rowing, for the wind was contrary unto them. In about the fourth watch, of the night between three and six in the morning. He came unto them walking upon the sea. He didn't jump in their boat. He walked on the sea and would have passed by them. Don't you care? Jesus we're struggling. We're possibly going down. But don't you care? Do you know how many people feel that way about Jesus? What they failed to remember is that he was on top of a mountain. He was safe. He was, he was just minding his own business. And he looked out into the sea and he said, you know, I think they're having some trouble. I want to give them a chance. I think I'll go for a walk. He walks. He doesn't say, hi, Jonathan. Need any help? He just walked by. Don't hear anything. I think I'll just keep walking until somebody cried out. Hey! Oh, you want my help? Of course I'll help. He didn't say, you got any money? He didn't say, have you fasted for six weeks? Did you pray your hour this morning? He just said, I'm walking. Oh, I'm going to stop here because I know he prayed an hour. So I'm going to, he just walked by. It doesn't matter whether you prayed five hours this morning. If you don't open up your mouth, he's not going to help you. But he's going to walk by and he's going to say, I'm waiting for somebody to say, hey, I need help. I can't do this on my own. And he's here this morning, and he's walking by, and he's waiting for somebody that will step forward and say, Lord, I need help. And he doesn't mean walk up to the altar and go, he wants somebody to come up and say, Jesus, Thou son of David, have mercy on me. I'm a sinner. I'm stuck. I need you to set me free. I'm in pain. I want you to heal me. Can somebody come and open up their mouth and tell him what you want? I need delivered. Is there anybody that's willing to take a chance on him as he walks down your street?